you very much. That, that was wonderful. Um, so I think what we'll have to do is perhaps steal maybe 10 minutes, if people are in agreement with us, to steal 10 minutes from the coffee break, so we'll only have 20 minute coffee break. Alyssa has graciously given us a few minutes, so we will, if we do that, we'll have maybe 15 minutes for questions. So please fire away. Yeah. Catherine. Okay, first of all, that was a brilliant tour de force. I mean, just on many uh, dimensions, so wow. Um, but secondly, it occurred to me that, I, I mean, as you've uh, spelled out what Rorty was doing, there's a way in which the people that led to his dropping philosophy did exactly the thing that he thinks ought to be done. So, for example, Kripke, when he gave those lectures and said, I'm just painting a picture, I'm not giving a theory, was, was changing the, 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 the logical space of doing philosophy. Uh, Lewis, when he says, let's take possible worlds to be real, he's changing the imaginative space of philosophy. So the idea that somehow or other, standard analytic philosophy of the most narrow-minded type, if you want, was somehow dead and just spinning its wheels was actually not true. And the very things he's talking about were, were being exemplified by the people he was trashing. Yeah. Yes, I think another, another aspect of that is the fact that he went on doing analytic philosophy. I mean, uh, you know, at the same time when he was saying in his books and his more official pronouncements, um, you know, I give up doing that sort of thing. I think it's a dead end and it's not serving any purpose. And uh, I want to sort of throw in my lot with the, the creative people and the Harold Blooms and the poets and the critics. He's still doing pretty technical work. You know, he's writing about Crispin Wright and about Davidson and he's engaging with Alec. So it remained, um, you know, a source of fascination for him. And he continued to do, yeah, what amounts to creative work in that. So I think he was, he was sort of half aware of that. I think he was sort of, well, as they say, conflicted in all kinds of ways, actually, after his great sort of change, change of views in, what, around the mid-70s, I suppose. When did the Mirror of Nature come out? 79, wasn't it, or 80? Yeah. So I think he half recognized that. And I, th I think if you put that to him, especially about Kripke, which was a really spectacular change in the way people started talking about, um, about reference, about language generally, then uh, he would hardly have denied that. Mm. Other questions? Yeah. Thanks. That was uh, quite uh, quite interesting. Um, I have a question about form, right? Um, when what about the poem? Um, you could not have said, or could not have said with the same effect, had you decided to write an essay on it. Right, um, because part of me wants to think, uh, in a way, it's a poem that is very close to an essay, uh, mm. and not as loose and free as a poem could have been. Um, mm. So why not go all the way, right, and explore even further the possibilities mm. of ambiguities and suggestions that well, it's part of the hallmark of poetry. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's part of a larger sort of enterprise or, or campaign, in a sense, to revive, like I said at the beginning, the, the idea of the verse essay. So it's a, a, a kind of poetry where you can argue a case, not perhaps as tightly or as consecutively as you would if you were writing an academic article. But, I mean, that, that's the first sort of ground-level justification for it. Uh, the reason for not doing it in, in a freer form of verse, you know, without rhyme, or at least without regular rhyme, and in a more uh, flexible meter, um, is that I, I find that that verse form is a very effective vehicle for argument. For two reasons. Firstly, you can construct arguments using um, fairly extended syntax, so there's room for qualifying clauses, and there's room to use the, the line breaks, I mean, the kind of turn you get through a line break that you wouldn't get in prose. In, in regular expository prose, to, uh, to point up a contrast or a qualification or a sudden turn of thought. And it may be a turn to a new theme or a kind of a... I mean, rhyme forces you to, um, to think thoughts that you wouldn't think if you were thinking in a straightforward consecutive way, just following through a sort of main track of argument that was more or less preconceived. So there are things there that I... There are connections I wouldn't have made had it not been for a fairly restrictive rhyme scheme, really. I think it's the old paradox of writing 
in traditional verse forms that what looks like a very regimented and rather restrictive style can in fact spark thoughts that you most likely wouldn't have unless you were sort of free associating or, um, or drunk or something um, otherwise. So it, it was the combination of trying to, yeah, trying to combine those two things. On the one hand, a reasonably, not rigorous, but consecutive argument with a form that actually sparked or, or prompted thoughts that wouldn't have otherwise have had. Um, and I think, I mean, the model is, is poets like, like well, obviously it's an immodest comparison, nothing like this good, but I mean, Pope and Dryden, you know, it's, it's closer to Dryden than Pope, actually. Right. Um, no, yeah. that's, that's very helpful. Can I just a b mm. brief follow-up? Um, in a way, uh, um, if you think of the poem as, as a piece of art, uh, it should stand on its own, right? So think about David Lynch saying, look, I'm not going to say anything about the film. You watch it. The film should, should say whatever I intended to say and, uh, or not say. So you watch the film. Otherwise, if I have to tell something about it, uh, then I wouldn't, write, I wouldn't mm. film. Right? Mm. So shouldn't the same standards be applied to, to the poem, right? So in a way, it shouldn't come with a, a preface, right? So, okay, yeah. let me put this into a context. I, I think it's a bit, again, I sort of fall back on the 18th century analogy. You know, if, you, if you're reading Pope, then you can't do without an annotated edition. Because one thing, you've got to know the politicians he was banging on about. You've got to know something about the political background. And you can take it as a work of art if you like, but if you don't actually know what he was talking about and what particular political quarrels were going on at the time and what his sources of funding were and who was sponsoring this, then you lose an awful lot. Right. So it's, it's that kind of poetry, I think, right. really. Obviously, Thank if you didn't have an interest in Rorty and in pragmatism and in the state of American philosophy, you'd, you, you know, you'd hang yourself for boredom. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I've always been wondering who the people are that Rorty is really attacking. So it looks like, you know, the idea of, you know, like coming from... Uh, uh, Germany as a philosopher, it has always struck me, it took me a while to even understand what English-speaking philosophers could possibly mean by the words analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. And the analytic stuff was easier to figure out because they mm. seem to mean philosophy, so I understand that. The continental, uh, I really never understood uh, mm. because some of this also seemed to just mean philosophy. And, uh, uh, and some other things uh, seem, to me, seem to mean things that I didn't understand something. Mm. Uh, so uh, that's hard by itself. I always say that, you know, like analytic philosophy doesn't make sense in Germany. The term and continental doesn't work in the way in which you couldn't get a continental breakfast in Germany. So <laughs> that's just, you know, like you can have a breakfast mm. and it would happen to be a German breakfast in the sense that it's a breakfast served in Germany. Yeah. And maybe typically involve certain things, you know, certain preference for certain eggs, etc. But so I never, so it took me a while to figure out. And when I, when, when I figured out what might be the object of attack, etc., none of the people that I thought were worth reading in English speaking philosophy uh, were anything like the analytic philosophers that Rorty was portraying there. Yeah. So I'm wondering what kind of, you know, like, isn't he just attacking on some level? Like, isn't th this just the high hopes that all of this is coming from a certain elitism that's associated with the word, uh, a certain ideals that he associates with the word American, strangely enough, mm. Um, mm. Uh, giving it another uh, uh, location? Isn't he just attacking bad philosophy? So uh, none of what's, you know, none of the good philosophy that calls itself analytic is anything, you know, like the way he's presenting it. So yes. I'm, you know, like, mm. isn't he just saying to everybody, be good philosophers? But then I'm wondering, you know, like, who, uh, so yeah. that's, uh, that has always struck me. Or, or did he just change the field so profoundly? And I grew up in a post rotian era, era that I can't even imagine how terrible philosophy must have been in America <laughs> yeah. before the Princeton department. Yeah. Well, I think in a sense he does have a kind of um, fictitious composite bugbear image of what he calls analytic philosophy. And he's very, I don't know whether he's scrupulous not to name people. He very rarely names the people he's attacking under this label. I think partly because he was, he was a benign sort of character, you know. He, um, he certainly had some kind of grudge against what he regarded as uh, the sort of behemoth, you know, of uh, analytic philosophy. But he, he rarely picks out individuals. And just as when he talks about continental philosophy, I mean, he, um, he's obviously not talking about, say, Husserl. 
well, at least not, not sort of transcendental phenomenology. He might be talking about life world phenomenology, perhaps. Um, uh, he's, if he, when he talks about Derrida, as I said, you know, he's talking about one very, it's a very snippety canon he has, in fact, of Derrida. It's Glass and it's uh, the postcard book, the first part of the postcard book. Now, but the problem with that is that, you know, if you read those texts, uh, they can be very amusing and entertaining and often quite philosophically insightful, but you have to read the other Derrida. You have to have read of grammatology, and otherwise they're just sort of improvisatory yeah. and... Um, yeah, that's right. So he, the, the stuff he misses out is absolutely crucial to understanding Derrida, let alone understanding. And I think his view of continental philosophy is a kind of... It's very close to the view the Yale critics had, those who were most receptive to Derrida's influence. It was playing off um, a kind of composite continental um, German and French philosophy against the Brits. And they, they saw, and Vorty sees, the British influence in, continent, in, in analytic, American analytic philosophy as being narrow, constrictive, hidebound, old-fashioned. But, old but the word is, you know, mm. like, uh, he's picking from the German side in particular, where I know that mm. the French side is quite different. He's just mm. picking out the kind of people that he liked to hang out with in Germany. Yes, so one yeah. Of the, the mm. way he's writing this history, you know, mm. making up this category of continental if you mm. want the Germans in the mix, you know. So mm. he just thought that Gadamer was nice to regularly That's right. hang out yeah. with. Well, it's, so yeah. he said mm. that Gadamer is the German continental philosophy. Well, that's it. And it's the Continentals read via American pragmatism, yeah, too. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. William so, James and Dewey stand at the end of every road, whether it's Foucault he's talking about or Hegel or, yeah. yeah. Mm. I, I have a question, that, but, but before that, I, I can contribute something by way of an answer to your your question about whom, whom you're attacking. I mean, I, he was an extraordinarily tolerant and nice man, but um, he, uh, I was a graduate student when he split with the Princeton department, so I was there before and after, and he was my advisor and so on. And uh, it, there, there was a lot of sort of personal, um, a big personal aspect to it, and he was very marginalized within the department. And so all of the big names, like Lewis and Kripke and Ben Asraf and Burgess and so on and so forth, were, and Harmon, were sort of, you know, roughly on the same side of things. And ethics, history, philosophy, and Rorty were a very, very small minority. And there was a lot of uh, sort of dissatisfaction about that, which is why he went to Virginia uh, very in, 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 during that period. And um, I mean, that's only part of the answer. But there was a sort of personal aspect to this reaction that very much had to do with these sort of immediate tensions he was experiencing. Mm -hmm. But my question was um, sort of about this uh, recommendation that we uh, change philosophy into to literature. And, um, the, I, I, want, I want to ask you whether you um, would sort of s have sympathy with a, a, a sort of slight reworking of that proposal or as, as a related idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, he, he seems, when he makes that remark, to have a, really a, a very specific idea of a certain kind of literature, right? Um, and, you, you know, it's not, it's not cognitive, it's metaphorical and fictional and but, but imaginative and so on. Um, of course, anybody who knows anything about literature knows that literature is extremely ordinarily various, right? I mean, it's, it's mm. some, and, and in the ancient world, you know, there was literature before there was even the idea of serious fiction. And so, mm. so, so that's one, one point one might make about him. But on the other hand, you could recast the thought, I think, in a, a much more compelling way without great difficulty. Um, we in the Anglophone world, in contrast, for example, to the German tradition, don't think a whole lot about how we write philosophy. And every major German philosopher that I can think of, after Kant anyway, and some before, thought very hard not only about the content of what they're going to argue, but about how to present it and why to present it in this way rather than that. So, you know, Hegel writes in a particular way from very specific, elaborate philosophical motives. It's not just sort of perversity or obscurantism. And, and, and Schlegel develops the fragment, and Nietzsche writes mm. in this similar fragmented way uh, for, for philosophical reasons. It's all very thought through. Wittgenstein's also in this tradition, yeah. later Wittgenstein, mm. uh, especially perhaps, perhaps also the early. Um, uh, whereas we, you know, what tends to happen with us in the Anglophone world is, you know, we read a few really good articles and we just sort of absorb the genre 
And we imitate it, basically. You know, you need your introduction, and then you need your position to be explained, and then you produce your counter-arguments. And, you know, it's all sort of very unreflected in terms of the genre. And that relates, incidentally, I think, also to a huge lacuna in Anglophone philosophy of language. You know, philosophers of language in the Anglophone world got rather quickly to the point of realizing that there's more to language than just meaning, there's mm. elocutionary force. But they still have not, I think, generally made the transition to realizing, as some uh, continental literary theorists and philosophers have realized for a long time, that genre is also a constitutive aspect of all language use. Yeah. Not only literary, but also non-literary. So what I'm doing now, what you were doing, um, uh, what we do when we write a journal article, write a history book or a newspaper editor, um, all these things, write a love letter or a, make a confession in a, a confessional, all these things are genres. Mm. And they're not just sort of accidentally there or there is contingent aspects to, of language use. Yeah. And so um, it, it's connected, I think, this rigidity in, the, in Anglophone philosophy with a sort of failure to theorize genre more generally and to think through, well, you know, there are different genres with different constitutive purposes and rules. And some of them are very different, some of them are rather similar, but with subtle differences and so on. So there are choices to be made. Uh, I wonder mm. if you, you a, a, a sort of reworking of Rorty's idea along those general lines would be... Yes, acceptable. I think so. And strangely, um, although he was very much against sort of dichotomizing, premature dichotomies of any kind, um, he did tend to assume that there was, a, there was a mode of writing, if you like, a genre of writing, or a, a speech act modality of writing, that was analytic, constative, um, theoretically inclined, resistant to any kind of what he would call literary style. And he equated that with sort of mainstream analytic um, philosophy. Um, and when he turned to Derrida, he, you know, he, what, what he admired in Derrida was the performative aspect of Derrida's style. But what he doesn't seem to to recognize is that Derrida can do both those things at the same time. You think of an essay like, um, well, White Mythology is probably the most spectacular example, where he's writing an essay on metaphor, and he's analyzing certain metaphors, but also certain concepts of metaphor, from Aristotle down to Bachelard, and he's doing it in a very careful, precise, um, analytic way, if you like, but he's also, at the same time, performatively rehearsing the implications of that argument by writing, well, I mean, there are occasional sort of purple patches, if you like, but the entire essay is very much in a performative mode, which doesn't exclude being intensely sort of self-critical and reflective as it goes along. I mean, it's an absolutely, you know, almost sort of unimaginably clever essay, actually. The more I read it, the more I'm just staggered by its, its depth and its reach and its scholarship and its, um, and its literariness. But you can't sort of lop off the literariness and say, I admire this about Derrida, the fact that he can write so brilliantly and inventively about metaphor, without recognizing that at the same time he is analyzing the concept of metaphor and specifying exactly where metaphor escapes the, um, uh, the categories of philosophical analysis um, and where you can't do without those categories because without them we wouldn't have a concept of metaphor. We wouldn't have the distinction between metaphor and concept, no matter how um, uh, sort of problematic that distinction. So he's doing a lot of things at once, but, but Rorty tends to think that he tends to, yeah, to dichotomize those two things and then to raise that dichotomy into a whole sort of typology of analytic versus continental. Mm. Thanks, thanks very much. I guess we should stop then and take our...